it has. Oh, here we go. Here we are. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine, and welcome to Authors Reading Aloud. I am excited to be here this evening and introduce you to my friend Richard Smith. Richard uh, will be sharing his uh, a, a few of his books with us actually this evening uh, and talk about his work as an author with Applewood Books and their short history series. Uh, Richard has lectured on and written about antebellum United States and 19th century American literature since 1999. He has worked as a public historian in Concord, Massachusetts for the past 21 years specializing uh, in Henry David Thoreau, the transcendentalists, the anti-slavery movement, and the Civil War. And uh, as I've already said, he has written five books for Applewood. So we are excited to hear what Richard has to share with us this evening, both from his words and his, uh, his advice in, in, in the work of writing. Uh, good evening, Richard. <laughs> Good evening, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for asking me to be part of this, this uh, Facebook page of yours. It, it's uh, really an honor to be here. Well, thank you so much. Um, do you have anything that you want to say before we get started this evening? No, I think that what's important about all these programs that you've been doing is um, I think people rarely get a chance to hear writers read from their own books. And, and I think that it's a great idea that we actually can be involved. And I mean, I, I've, I've never really read my books after they were published. <laughs> and it, it's kind of interesting that, that people get to hear us read our own words, which I think is really wonderful. So thank you so much for inviting me to do this. Of course, thank you for participating. All right, I'm going to hand things over to you. Okie doke. So, well, you know, I've been in Concord now as, a, as an independent historian since 1999. Uh, like most historians, um, I have a lot to say. <laughs> and I just didn't really, and I always wanted to write a book, but I never really knew how to go about doing it. Did I need to find a publisher? And I felt like every time I wanted to write a book, I had these great ideas like I wanted to write a book about Concord in the Civil War, and then somebody wrote a book about Concord in the Civil War. And then I thought, oh, I should write a book about John Brown and the Transcendentalists. And then this really great biography of John Brown came out, and it talks about his relationship with the Transcendentalists. So I always felt like I had great ideas, but people were already doing them. And I've always been more comfortable writing essays and lectures. I just didn't know if I had the time to sit down and write a two or three or 400 page book. Um, so 2017 uh, was the bicentennial of, of Henry David Thoreau's birth. And I was working at the shop of Walden Pond, at the shop at Walden Pond where I still work. I've been there since 2008. And we always carried Applewood books. Um, and so one of, the, uh, one of the Applewood representatives came in at the beginning of 2017 and asked me if I knew anybody who would want to do a quotations of Henry Thoreau book. And I said, yeah, me. <laughs> and, and so it, it just kind of snowballed after that. So in 2017, my first book was uh, quotations of Henry David Thoreau. And Applewood Books has been around since 1976. And on their website, they say that they want to build a picture of America through its primary sources. And they've got like over 2,500 titles. If you've ever been to a national park, if you've ever been to a, 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 a museum store, you will see Applewood books. They're everywhere, all across the country. And they've got things like, you know, the small books, they're all small. They're like 30, 35 pages. And they've got like the Declaration of Independence or the Confederate Constitution or um, George Washington's Rules of Civility. So all of their books are based on primary sources. And so when you're doing quotation books, and they've got quotations from everybody all the way up to the 20th century, Franklin Roosevelt, Dr. King. And so they did not have a quotations of Henry David Thoreau. They asked me if I would want to do it. 
and I ended up doing it. And that was the first book that I did. Um, I've had nothing but good experiences with Applewood. They let me choose the quotations that I did. They, they told me to choose a hundred because they would probably cut three or four or five. So I did 100 quotations of Thoreau, including five that I didn't particularly like. So then when I got the, got the message to cut five of the quotes, I cut the five that I didn't like. So, so this was the first book that I, that I had published. I got to choose the, uh, the wallpaper. It's a 19th century wallpaper. Um, and uh, so I basically chose my, my favorite thorough quotes. And I also did it chronologically from 1837 when he started keeping a journal um, all the way up to when he died in 1862. Um, I took quotes from his letters, from his journals, from his essays, from his books. Um, I wanted to get a really good cross section of all of Thoreau's quotes so that people would get a pretty good idea as to what he was all about. Um, one of my favorites, I wish my countrymen to consider that whatever the human law may be, neither an individual nor a nation can ever commit the least act of injustice against the obscurest individual without having to pay the penalty for it. A government which deliberately enacts injustice and persists in it will at length ever become the laughing stock of the world. And that's from slavery in Massachusetts in 1854. So I kind of got to do a really good cross section of all of, of Henry's quotes. I, I tried to be political. Uh, I tried to be get his nature stuff. I tried to get in his sense of humor. Um, I had to throw in some of the Gray's hits like in wildness is the preservation of the world from 1857. Um, when I hear music, I fear no danger. I am invulnerable. I see no foe. I am related to the earliest times and to the latest. That's from his journal from January of 1857. So I thought that I, I could give him a pretty, give him a pretty good cross section of all of the moods of Henry Thoreau. Um, and so after that, it kind of snowballed. And I then did my next book, which was Quotations of John Muir. Still kind of Thoreauvian, still kind of transcendental. Um, but, but John Muir lived a lot longer than Henry Thoreau. And so I still got only 100 quotes. Um, and I tried to give a really good cross section. But like my Thoreau book, I did it chronologically as well. I started with his earliest quotes and worked my way up to, uh, to the year that he died. So um, for those of you who don't know Richard, yeah, he's been very modest uh, talking about working at the shop at Walden Pond, uh, but that's, that's not all that he does. Uh, I can't think of anybody who would be better suited to uh, put together uh, this book of quotes for Henry Thoreau. Uh, Richard has actually been doing living history as Henry Thoreau for a number of years. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been outed. Uh, putting, putting together uh, quite a, a, a number of really wonderful uh, living history programs, uh, educating people around the country. Uh, and if you, if you ever have the opportunity to do one of his tours or uh, attend one of his, his lectures as Henry, uh, I, I have hope that one day we'll, we'll get back to a place where we can attend such events, but they are amazing, so. Well, I think, and I think that because I, I've been doing living history as thorough since 1999, uh, you know, I, I look back on it now, but when the representative from Applewood came into the shop and said, do you know anybody? Looking back on it, it, it I, I felt like I was being really cheeky and going, yeah, I can do that. I mean, I'd never written a book in my life, but I thought, well, if there's anybody that can come up with a hundred quotes by Henry Thoreau, I'm, I'm probably the guy that could do it. So, and, and, and they knew that. They, the people at Applewood knew who I was anyway. So it's not like I was just some guy off the streets who said, sure, I can write a book. <laughs> there was a little bit of, little bit of knowledge as to who I was and, and what I can do. So, so uh, I, was, 
I was really fortunate to be in, in the right place at the right time. Um, and uh, Phil, Phil Zuckerman is the, uh, he's the, the big boss over at Applewood. And he's been absolutely wonderful in being really supportive um, in, in letting me pretty much have control over, at least over the quote books that I've done. Um, the John Muir quote book, um, the wallpaper is, is actually from the John Muir house in, in California. Um, I forget if it was me or, or my editor, uh, Susan DeLand, but one of us said, oh, we should contact the John Muir house and see if we can use their wallpaper, one of their wallpapers for the book. Um, and so I did contact them and they were like, sure. And they sent me like three or four swaths of different wallpapers from the different rooms of the John Muir house. And so I chose, I chose this one, which I thought was, was the best one. It's, I think it's from, might be from one of the parlors at the John Muir house. And it's the same thing. I, you know, the quote books, I really like doing because I can really kind of go in any direction. I can be, you know, John Muir, like Thoreau, was spiritual. He was funny. He was political. He was a little bit angrier at times than Thoreau when it came to nature. Um, but, uh, you know, he's very, like Thoreau, he's very transcendental. Nature is always lovely, invincible, glad. Whatever is done and suffered by her creatures, all scars she heals, whether in rocks or water or sky or hearts. Uh, it's from his journal from, from 1895. Uh, death is as natural as life, sorrow as joy. Through pain and death come all our blessings, life and immortality. So, and then this is one of his famous ones. God never made an ugly landscape. All that the sun shines on is beautiful, so long as it is wild, from 1895. Uh, you know, I, I, John Muir is definitely... He's like, if Henry Thoreau had lived another 30 years, I think he would have become like John Muir. Um, and so John, and John Muir openly talked about how both Emerson and Thoreau were a huge influence on him. And, and so doing a John Muir quotation book was not, was not that different than doing a Henry Thoreau quotation book because I got, to exp I got to write about all of their moods and, and, and really do a nice cross section of what they were all about. Those led to doing short biographies. Um, there's a, it's, called, it's called Benna Books. They're an imprint of Applewood Books and they do what they're called short biographies. They've got dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Um, and because I, I guess they were happy with what I did with the quotation books, they asked me if I would do short biographies, which then that became real writing <laughs> as, a, as opposed to just throwing a bunch of quotations. To, and and make it, I make it sound so easy. I just threw a bunch of quotations together. But, but you know, writing, uh, writing these short biographies presented a whole bunch of challenges that I had not encountered when I was doing the quotation books. And I, we were chatting a little bit before the show, um, Richard. What what were some of the challenges uh, in in putting these books together? Um, yeah. So the, the short biography. We all have different ideas of what might be the most important chapters to include from a life. Right. So the short biographies. I've got the short biography of Muir, Henry Thoreau, and then my latest one was Alexander Hamilton. Um, they give me 4,500 words. That's all I get. 4,500 words to do a biography of any of these people. And, and um, in the books, there are little, there are little, I don't know if you can see it, but there are little side notes. Those are included in the 4,500 words that I'm allowed. So, and then in between sections. That's amazing. <laughs> right. I, uh, in I, between sections there are quotations those are included in the 4500 words as well so so i get 4500 words um and there's a quote on the back that's 40 it's included in the 4500 words 
So for those so, of us who, who are thinking of back to those days in school where we were forced to write essays, that might seem like a lot, like it would be painful to get to that number. But for those of us who have a topic that we care about, uh, that, that we know something about, confining <laughs> to 4,500 words is extremely challenging. It's extremely challenging. And you know, as I'm sitting there on the laptop writing away, I'm looking at the word count at the bottom you know, going up and up and up and up and up. And so uh, what I did, and I did the, the, the John Muir book was the first biography that I actually, the first biography I wrote was the Henry Thoreau biography, but the John Muir biography came out before it. But the Henry Thoreau biography, uh, because I'm so well acquainted with, with his life, I was able to just kind of sit and do it, and and it was almost like free form writing, and I and I at first I was really trying to focus on the 4,500 words, but I found myself being really stifled. So I thought, well, the heck with it. I'll just write this biography, and whatever it is, then I'll just start to cut stuff. I, I find it easier to write it and then cut it, as opposed to editing editing it as I go along. I find that if I'm trying to self-edit as I'm writing, I'm not saying what I want to say. So I figured, okay, well, so I'll write, I'll write 10,000 words and then cut it down to 4,500 <laughs> or, or whatever it is my final word count was. So did you have any, uh, any changes from your editor about uh, what they thought should be included in that word count? Yeah, so so I'm writing about Henry Thoreau, and so the the famous one of the famous stories that I did not have in my manuscript after I sent my manuscript in, there's the famous story that um, both Henry Thoreau and his brother John were in love with the same woman and they both proposed to her. Um, I did not put that in my manuscript because I just felt there were other things that I thought were more important. So my manuscript had been turned in, my editor contacted me and she said, did you know that Henry Thoreau and his brother proposed to the same woman? I said, well, yeah, I did. She goes, why isn't that in the book? And I'm like, um, didn't think it was important. And she goes, I think you should put that in the book. I said, well, you know, an, a, another woman also proposed to Henry Thoreau later in life. She goes, oh, you should put that in the book. So then I said, well, how many words do I get? to explain Henry's love life. And she said, 75. So I, I, I got- explain his entire love life in 75 words. Well, actually, you know, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, there was, I, my understanding, he, there wasn't much to talk about. Right, it's not like we're talking about Romeo or somebody here. <laughs> so, so, you know, thank God, you know, at least Emerson was married twice. He couldn't say anything in 75 words about that. So, so here, here is, so here's the, the, the first paragraph. Actually, no, here are those 75 words. In 1839, the Thoreau brothers met Ellen Sewell of Situate, Massachusetts, the niece of a family friend. Both were captivated by the pretty 17 year old and fell madly in love with Ellen. John proposed to her. She initially accepted his offer, but soon declined it. Henry then proposed to Ellen, by letter, but like John was also turned down. Henry, initially crushed, soon recovered, though on his deathbed reportedly he said, quote, I have always loved her. This was not Thoreau's only brush with marriage. In 1847, Sophia Ford arrived in Concord to tutor the Alcott girls. She fell in love with Henry, believing him to be her soulmate. Much to Thoreau's mortification, Miss Ford proposed to him. Henry sent her, quote, a distinct no, but she persisted, sending more letters asking for his hand. Thoreau never replied and burned the letters. He remained a bachelor to the end of his days. <laughs> and then up in the corner, I've got a little side note. Upon Thoreau's refusal, uh, Miss Ford threatened suicide. Uh, she did not act, and eventually her ardor for Thoreau cooled. She died in 1885 unmarried. So those were my 75 words. 
explaining Henry's love life, <laughs> which thank God, thank God he said no to both, both, both of those didn't turn out very well, or I would have had to do it in more words, I suppose. <laughs> well done. <laughs> so, so um, I wrote that first, but you know, one, it's weird, once you turn the manuscript in, and you know this as well as I do, once you turn the manuscript in, you're relieved but nervous all at the same time because oh, yeah absolutely terrified <laughs> right you know because because you know and and the longer the longer it's at the editor the longer you're thinking oh my god it must really suck because i haven't heard from them in weeks um the the quotes books went really quickly and the turnaround was really fast but once i once i started turning in those short biographies you know the muir book I wrote, I turned that in. It went fairly quickly, but it seemed like, I think it was like, it felt like a year before the thorough short biography was published, um, which was in my mind, it was the easiest one to write because I know Henry so well. John Muir was a little bit harder. I know him, but not as not as as detailed as I know Thoreau's life. So I actually had to go through a, a bunch of I had a whole stack of of, uh, of books about John Muir, uh, taking notes and, and trying to figure out what to put into 4500 words. The problem with John Muir um, is he lived a really long time. And, and I was always joking with my editors and I had a different editor for the biographies than I did for the quote books. I was always joking with my editor about she should just give me people who lived a really short life instead of somebody who lived a long time because you can do a short life you can do a short life in in 4500 words but you can't do a long life in 4500 words <laughs> and, and Muir is quite the adventurer he has a lot to fit into those those 4500 words he traveled the world he went to china uh, you know he he dealt with politicians you know, he, but it was really interesting because Thoreau loved writing books. John Muir hated writing books. He hated it. It was it was such a chore to him. And so, as I'm writing this biography, I'm I'm like, yeah, I I feel you, John. I get it. <laughs> because trying to take this ama amazing man who lived a long time and and get it down to 4,500 words was was pretty hard. So, um, but one of my favorite moments in American history is when Muir in 1903, um, he spent the night with Teddy Roosevelt in Yosemite. Um, one of my favorite moments, there's that really famous photograph of the two of them. Um, Absolutely, I have, would love to go on that camping trip. <laughs> seriously, it would have been amazing. And, <laughs> and I love, I, I, there's a lot of things I love about Teddy Roosevelt as well. So this is when Muir and, and, Ro and President Roosevelt spent the night together. In May of 1903, Muir made one of the most important connections of his life when he was asked by President Theodore Roosevelt to guide him through the Sierra and Yosemite. The two men had corresponded but had never met. And knowing that he was going to be visiting Yosemite, Roosevelt knew that Muir was the only one who could show him around. Of course, of all the people in the world, he was the one with whom it was best worthwhile thus to see the Yosemite, Roosevelt would write. I do not want anyone with me but you, and I want to drop politics absolutely for four days and just be out in the open with you. Can you imagine a president saying, I want to drop politics for four days? So... Roosevelt was followed by a huge contingent of staff, dignitaries, and newspaper reporters. He and Muir managed to give them the slip and, with two pack mules bearing their camping supplies, went deep into the woods and camped among the giant sequoias. Just the idea of John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt camping in the sequoias is... Oh my God. <laughs> right. It's mind-blowing. Their trip started at the Mariposa Grove and included Sentinel Dome, Glacier Point, Yosemite Valley, and other points of interest in the park. Roosevelt qu wrote, quote, there can be nothing in the world more beautiful than the Yosemite, the groves of the giant sequoias and redwoods, 
the Canyon of the Colorado, the Canyon of the Yellowstone, the Three Tetons. And our people should see to it that they are preserved for their children and their children's children forever with their majestic beauty unmarried, unmarred. They spent the entire trip talking about nature and conservation. Roosevelt, a lifelong birder, was a little surprised when Muir didn't know the various bird songs they heard. Muir, for his part, did his best to dissuade the president from his, quote, childish practice of hunting. Even so, the two men enjoyed their time together and the trip accomplished what Muir hoped it would. Roosevelt became the first president to take an active role in land preservation. Three years later, Roosevelt signed the Antiquities Act, a precursor to the National Park Service, which obligated federal agencies to preserve scientifically, culturally, and historically valuable sites. Roosevelt would sign into existence five national parks, 18 national monuments, 55 national bird sanctuaries and wildlife refuges, and 150 national forests. So because of John Muir, a lot of the national parks that we love today were created thanks to that one night that he spent with, uh, with Teddy Roosevelt uh, in the Yosemite. Uh, I, I consider that one maybe the most important camping trip <laughs> in American history. Uh, so, so, so I had to put that's that in quite the book. fair. I, ha I had to put that in the book. I, I you know, it's, it's just, a, and, and the more I read about him and the more I wrote about John Muir, um, the more I really, really started to admire him. Um, you know, he's not, in some ways he's like Thoreau, but in other ways he's completely unlike Henry. You know, I can't see Henry Thoreau camping with a president. Uh, in the woods somewhere. You know, Muir knew that he had to work with the man in, in order to get his goals achieved. I don't know if, if Thoreau would have been that willing to work with politicians. Although the poli Teddy Roosevelt of the 1890s is unlike any politician that, that Thoreau would have been dealing with you know, in the 1840s and 1850s. So, so to say that he wouldn't do that, I think is a little unfair. Um, but yeah, I, I really started to admire John Muir. And in fact, back in 2017, I got to, was it 2017, 2018, somewhere around there, I got to go out to Missouri and do a living history weekend as thorough. Um, and I got to do it with uh, Lee Stetson, who is the official Yosemite John Muir um, and uh, does an amazingly brilliant job. And so I got to spend uh, four days with with John Muir um, <laughs> out in out in Missouri, and we had some really cool pictures taken um, of John Muir and Henry Thoreau standing together. And meanwhile, John John Muir, <laughs> which was which was kind of cool. Yeah. Oh, I get to spend four days with Henry Thoreau. <laughs> well, you know, and it was this has nothing to do with the writing, but you know, when we did our programs. Uh, as thorough, I read walking. And so, you know, and I would take questions as thorough and, and Henry was pretty prickly. And, and, you know, one of the first things I said was that, that it was strange to be out in Missouri and I hope that none of them were border ruffians. <laughs> and they all laughed, of course, ha ha ha. Oh, that Henry. Um, so it was really fun, but, but John Muir, uh, at least the way that Lee Stetson portrays him, he's very charming and very friendly. And Henry was just Henry, and uh, <laughs> wasn't wasn't as charming as Mr. Muir was, I'm sure. <laughs> so then the Thorough book came out, and my editor asked me after it was published if I wanted to do another short biography, and I said sure. And she said, okay, how about William Faulkner? And I was like, uh, no, I don't like William Faulkner. <laughs> Just not a fan. And plus, you know, 20th century, ew. Um, and so. Yeah, at, at least you, you're honest. You, you know, well, yeah. you can fly. Yeah, I'm like, uh, no. And so, and I told her, I said, you know, I kind of want to get away from writers. And she said, okay, well, how about uh, the 18th century? I said, sure. 
I love the 18th century. And she said, what about politicians? I said, sure, I love 18th century politicians. And so then that's when they, she asked me if I would do the short biography of Alexander Hamilton, which every time I say that, my friends then start to sing Alexander Hamilton from, from, <laughs> from the Broadway show. Um, but that was a real challenge for me as well. Uh, I knew Alexander Hamilton, but I didn't know him a lot. Um, the big 400 page biography by, by, uh, by Chernow had come out. The, the Broadway show had already been a smash hit. Um, so I, I was deter so I didn't read the biography. I didn't even listen to the music from the Broadway show, which I love. Um, I hadn't heard it at the time. I really wanted to kind of go in thinking that I knew some stuff about Alexander Hamilton, but I, I ended up doing way more research for his, for that book um, than I did for the other biographies that I did. So it sounds like uh, you started for, with the very familiar piece of advice that every writer has heard, start with what you know, with right. Henry Thoreau, and then move slightly out of your comfort zone to, into John Muir, someone that you were somewhat familiar with, but had to do a little bit more research with, and then into this whole new different world with Alexander Hamilton. Right, because the only thing I really knew about him was about his service during the Revolutionary War, and that he was killed by, by you know, by Burr. And so uh, I knew a little bit, you know, father of the US Treasury, um, probably born uh, illegitimately. Um, so I knew the little things, but uh, the more research I did, uh, you know, I really, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is true for you or not, but whenever I write about somebody or if I lecture about somebody, I tend to lecture about people that I like you know, whether it's John Brown or, or Thomas Wentworth Higginson or, or the Alcott's or whoever. Um, the more I, oh, I, I, I... Sometimes I just talk about things that make me mad. <laughs> <laughs> but, do you, but you've written about people you don't particularly like. In your Confluence book, there's all kinds of people in there that, that I can't see you really wanting to associate with. Um, I, I have a, a very different set of values than many 19th century uh, slaveholders. Yes, that would be true. Right, absolutely. Uh, and so, their, their opinions would be very different from mine on, on quite a number of issues, I'm sure. Sure. So when I'm lecturing about, you know, Colonel Robert Gould Shaw or, or Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higginson, you know, I'm all about them. I love them. And so it's really easy. Alexander Hamilton... I, I didn't know at first if I liked him, but then the more I read about him and researched him and started writing about him, the more I really did start to like him. But the, I think I liked him because a lot of the founding fathers hated him. And so I was kind of, you know, John Adams couldn't stand him. Um, <laughs> but John Adams, couldn't stand, John Adams couldn't stand anybody. Um, that's that's true. John Adams didn't like Harper's Ferry either. Right. See, so so we'll just forget him. So, <laughs> but I, you know, because Alexander Hamilton, you know, he was born in the Caribbean. Um, you know, his parents were not married. Um, he was he was considered illegitimate. You know, he's not like, and I say that in my book, he's not like the other founding fathers. The other founding fathers came from press, most of them came from prestige and wealth and position. And Hamilton pretty much had to, to fight his way from a very early age all the way up to, you know, being involved in government because other, the other founding fathers did not take him seriously um, because of his, because of his, what they considered his sketchy upbringing and, and sketchy background. I will say that out of all the founding fathers, at least I feel this way, I think he was probably the most brilliant out of all of them. Um, he, was, he was absolutely brilliant. And, and he's one of the, he's kind of like Thoreau. He, can pick, he could pick up anything and be really good at it. He's one of those guys who had like this really calculating mind. And I guess 
that's one thing all of these men that I've written about, they, they had all had these incredibly brilliant calculating minds. Um, and Hamilton was definitely one of those people. And the more I read about him and the more I wrote about him, the more I liked him. So um, there's a couple of things I'd like to read. So he's involved in the, in the, the Constitutional Convention. Um, he was the only delegate from New York. New York sent one delegate and it was him. Um, and he really thought that he was going to have a lot to do. He wanted to be really involved. Um, he didn't really like the Articles of Confederation. And so he thought putting together a new constitution was the way to go. So Hamilton hoped to be deeply involved in the Constitutional Convention, but as it turned out, his involvement as the delegate from New York was limited. In the one speech that he made before the delegation, he proposed the idea that the president and senators should be elected for life, contingent upon good behavior and subject to removal for corruption or abuse of power. So he, yeah, once you're elected as president, according to Hamilton, you're in for life. So unless you're, unless you're removed. He called this the elective monarchy. Um, the suggestion was summarily rejected by the rest of the delegates <laughs> because they just got rid of a monarchy. And Hamilton himself had to deal with accusations from James Madison that he was a monarchist sympathizer. He also put together his own draft of the constitution. So, so while they're all debating the constitution, Hamilton's writing his own constitution which I just think is so gutsy. But he never presented it to the delegates. Um, Hamilton was not entirely pleased with the constitution that was ultimately drafted, but he signed it anyway, thinking it a vast improvement from the old Articles of Confederation. Regardless of his reservations about the constitution, he was instrumental in promoting the new document. The most important service he performed towards ratification was as one of the writers of the Federalist Papers, a series of essays used to explain and promote the Constitution. These articles appeared in the New York Packet, the Daily Advertiser, and the Independent Journal between October 1787 and August 1788. Hamilton, along with James Madison and John Jay, published 85 essays hoping to influence the public sentiment toward ratification. While Madison wrote 29 of the essays and Jay wrote five, Hamilton was the primary contributor to the Federalist Papers. It was after all, he who enlisted the help of the other two. Not only did he write 51 of the articles, he also supervised the entire project from conception to final publication. Each man writing under the shared pseudonym of Publius wrote on the subjects that were his particular specialty, with Hamilton focusing on the powers and duties of the executive and judicial branches, as well as covering military matters and governmental taxation. Um, when it came to finances, I mean, he created, he created the monetary system that we're still using today. And of course, he was the first secretary of the treasury. So when it came to stuff like that, um, he was absolutely brilliant. One good thing about writing this book was I got to go back and read the Federalist Papers, which I hadn't done in a really long time. Um, I'm sure as a former lawyer, you've read the Federalist Papers. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, every every weekend I just, just uh, peruse. Oh, yeah. What else is there to do in Harpers Ferry? <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, uh, you know, if anybody's going to read anything about Alexander Hamilton, I, I think they should read the Federalist Papers. Um, absolutely incredible. And, Start and, with the source. I'm sorry? Start with the source. I think that's the best advice. In fact, those were, those were probably the first things that I started to read before I wrote this biography um, uh, to get a, a sense of, of what he was all about. Um, of course, the, the, most, the most famous, one of the most famous things about Alexander, Alexander Hamilton, I think, is the way that he died. 
Um, you know, he was he was killed in the duel with Aaron Burr. They had known each other for a few years. They didn't particularly like each other anyway. Um, and so uh, four years later, Burr ran to be governor of New York, but lost to Morgan Lewis, a Democrat Republican. Hamilton had strongly campaigned against Burr and Burr knew it. In April 1804, a letter was published in an Albany newspaper that quoted Charles D. Cooper, an associate of Hamilton's father-in-law, as saying that Hamilton had a despicable opinion of Burr. Seeing the letter, an irate Burr immediately sent off a letter to Hamilton wanting to know if the story was true, and if so, he demanded an apology. Hamilton refused, saying that the so-called insult was strictly another man's interpretation. The debate over the despicable opinion went back and forth between the two men. Burr wanted to know whether Hamilton had said anything demeaning, while Hamilton continually maintained that there was no specific insult, nor could he remember the particulars of the conversation with Cooper in the first place. Finally, Burr had had enough. He needed to recover his honor, and he challenged Hamilton to a duel. Hamilton accepted. He felt, too, that his own honor was at stake. They met at just past 7 o'clock on the morning of July 11, 1804, at the heights of Weehawken, New Jersey, across the Hudson River from Manhattan. Dueling had been outlawed in New York, and while it was also illegal in New Jersey, that state was not as interested in prosecuting duelists as New York. Weehawken was a popular dueling site. 18 known duels occurred there between 1700 and 1845. After the formalities were out of the way, Hamilton and Burr stood several yards apart and faced each other. In most duels, often each participant would fire his pistol into the ground or up in the air, thus showing courage and hopefully satisfying honor. Hamilton, who fired first, did this, firing well over Burr's head into the trees above and behind Burr's location, and deliberately missing Burr, who, for his part, then took careful aim. He shot, his shot hit Hamilton in the lower abdomen, just above his right hip. The lead ball ricocheted off one of Hamilton's ribs and fractured it before plowing into his internal organs. His liver and diaphragm suffered heavy damage before the ball came to a stop, lodged in his first or second lumbar vertebrae. It was a killing shot, and Hamilton was paralyzed from the waist down. Hamilton dropped to the ground. His seconds and a doctor who was attending the duel rushed to him, where Hamilton said, quote, this is a mortal wound, doctor. He was rowed back across the river, unconscious to Manhattan, and taken to the Greenwich Village home of a friend, where he was given Holy Communion by a local Episcopalian bishop. The next day, his wife Elizabeth and his children came to be with him. After a night in excruciating pain, Hamilton died the next day, July 12, 1804, surrounded by more than 20 family members and friends. He was 49 years old. Burr never went to trial for the illegal duel, and the charges were dropped. This did, however, end Aaron Burr's political career. Interesting, he died on July 12th, 1804. July 12th is also Henry Thoreau's birthday, <laughs> which I thought was an interesting little side note. So um, I, find, I find his death to be particularly disturbing because I think it was absolutely unnecessary. Um, oddly enough, um, his son, in fact, that, that's one of my little sidebars. Um, coincidentally, Hamilton's oldest son, Philip, uh, fought a duel um, in 1801 on the same dueling ground, and he was killed as well. So both Alexander Hamilton and his son died in a duel in Weehawken, New Jersey, within a few years of each other, which I thought was one of those weird little historic coincidences that you would never put into a book unless it really happened. Oh my, oh my. 
I, I hope that the Hamiltons stay off that field. Well, you know, the, the good thing about, so Hamilton was pretty unknown. I think there are people that see him on, on the $10 bill and they still think he was a president of some sort. So the best thing that happened to Alexander Hamilton was the musical. Um, and I've never seen it, but I love the soundtrack and I listen to it all the time. Um, and it, uh, it's turned a lot of people on to not only Alexander Hamilton, but I think it's turned a lot of people on to history as well. And I have no, uh, you know, I'm, ag I'm against bad historical movies, uh, but somehow the musical, he made Alexander Hamilton really cool. Yes, I, I was teaching government uh, to high schoolers and uh, they, these kids knew all of these intricacies of, of American government and constitutional debate because of Hamilton. Right. <laughs> and they and would burst into song in the middle of class, which was kind of disruptive, but I, I didn't mind because they were engaging in the conversation. And it, it's not always easy to get a classroom excited about the Federalist Papers. No, if you if you've got a bunch of kids singing Federalist songs to you from a from in, in rap, that's okay by me. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like I said, when I was when winning, I, that was a winning day as a teacher. When I was working on it, my friends would say, "Well, what are you working on?" I'd say, "Oh, I, I'm working on a the short biography of Alexander Hamilton," and my friends would break into song, <laughs> which got annoying after a while, you, you know who you are. Um, but, but yeah, I, so those are my five books. Um, I have a sixth one in progress. I was asked to write, um, they, they, they have a book called um, The Signers of the Declaration of Independence and they're little biographies of each of the signers I did signers of the of the United States Constitution, and uh, there were 87 of them, and I had to do little 100 word biographies of each of the signers of the of the Constitution. Which and just to clarify, I mean, this is quite a list of luminaries here. Well, well yeah, I mean. Uh, you know, and I, I, I said this to you before, though, but, you know, for a while when I was researching each one of them, I was just going to put white Southern slaveholder lawyer, white Southern slaveholder lawyer, because that's all they were. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, try try writing a biography of, of Benjamin Franklin in 100 words um, or 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 Alexander Hamilton or any of the other luminaries. Uh, you know, I, I got to the point where when I was researching them, if their life was not particularly interesting, other than the fact that they signed the Constitution, it was almost a relief, because I knew that I could write something about them in 100 words. It's like, oh, thank God, he didn't do anything huge. You know, he didn't start a college, <laughs> or he wasn't Benjamin Franklin. So I, I finished that. It's been, it's been, a long time now since I turned that manuscript in because I think partly because of the COVID, but also um, that was probably the hardest one that I've had to write um, because, uh, you know, I'm a good historian, but I cannot name the 87 signers of the constitution off the top of my head. I mean, can you, you know, <laughs> that is not a test I have ever been put to, and I am glad. Well, right, yeah. So, so you know, so I would be researching these guys, and I would be like, who? You know, who's this? So, so the way that I did it, I, I wrote about them. I went by state. So I, I did it alphabetically by state. So, I, you know, I started with Delaware and went down alphabetically through all the states. Pennsylvania was the hardest because they had the most delegates, if I remember correctly, one of whom was Ben Franklin. No, Virginia was hard because you had George Washington, you had Madison. Yeah, try, try putting a biography of, of James Madison into 100 words. So, so Virginia was the hardest out of all of the states, I think. I know. Uh... In, in my book, in, in Confluence, uh, we have a couple captions 
just trying to caption a life beneath a, oh. a portrait um, is, is, was almost impossible. I have captions that turned into sidebars because we couldn't. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I mean. I, uh, so I, I, what an extraordinary challenge trying to fit so many, as, as you said, some of them uh, had limited interest in their lives, but, but some of them on that list are just, I mean, we could fill entire libraries with what's been written about them and trying to cram all of that information into with the 100 best words to convey to someone who may not know the story. Right. I, you know, I, I, I will say that yeah. working on these books, I think it's made me a better writer in the sense that, I mean, you know, I can go on, I can go on for hours about any of these guys <laughs> or, or, you know, when I'm, when I'm working at the shop at Walden Pond, you know, somebody will say, what can you tell me about transcendentalism? And I always say, well, do you want the three hour answer? Or, or do you want, you know, do you want the thumbnail? So I can go on about any of this stuff. So having to put it down in writing and, and I'm, I'm almost glad that I have a word count with these books because then you have to, like you said, you have to choose the best words um, about, about getting your point across. And so I think writing these books has definitely made me a much better writer. I, I can't even imagine doing a 400 page book because, you, you know, I'd work on it for probably 15 years because, you know, I, I, how do you, how do you self edit yourself if you've got unlimited word count? Uh, you know, like I said, I'm much, I'm much happier writing lectures and essays. So writing a short biography of somebody is along the same lines as writing a 45 minute or an hour long lecture um, or, or an essay. I'm, I'm much happier doing the shorter stuff um, than I am writing, writing the big books. Well, it certainly does fill an important, uh, an important space on the proverbial bookshelf. Uh, uh, here in Harper's Ferry, uh, we sell a few of these little books and um, Yes, there are much larger biographies, um, much more extensive quote collections, but for the person who is just coming in and just has just been introduced to this character in time, this, this idea, and just wants something to learn just a little bit more, or perhaps they want a, a favorite essay or something to carry with them, um, they're, they're really nice little books just to hold and a lot of care does go into them as you were describing the research into the, um, the historic wallpapers that form the design of the book. Um, so that they are really nice little things to have in your collection and, and they do, as I said, they, they, they kind of offer that invitation. Uh, well, and I, I, I think that's, and, and that's what Applewood likes to do. I mean, you know, I, I, I like to Google my books to see where they're being carried. <laughs> and I'm happy to say that the Alexandra Hamilton book is being carried at the New York Historical Society. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, you're not, you're, you're gonna get basic facts. You know, it's not like buying Ron Chernow's book of, of Hamilton, but you know, they're small, they're $10, they're nice little keepsakes. And they just give you a taste, I think, of, of what you, of, of these people that we're writing about, you know, so hopefully somebody will buy my biography of, of Henry Thoreau, and then if they want to know more, then they can buy the, the big biography by, by Laura Walls, um, or by Bob Richardson. Um, and, and so, yeah, these books are good for, for piquing your interest or, or, you know, maybe that's all you want to know about Alexander Hamilton is 34 pages. So, you know, you might read that and go, okay, I'm good. I know everything I need to know about this guy. So I think that Applewood books, you know, definitely they serve a purpose. They're nice little keepsakes. You know, you can go to a battlefield and get the, the constitution of the Confederate States of America <laughs> and, 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 and read about that. And, or, you know, the rules of civility by George Washington, which I think 
I think I saw that when when I was at Mount Vernon. I think they carry that at Mount Vernon. So so yeah, so you can kind of really they do they they I think they're important. They fill a space, um, which I think is sorely needed uh, because they're not big, they're small, they're full full of information, and that's really kind of all the people. And they're ten bucks, so I think that's all that people a lot of people really want. And so um, I've been really happy at the shop at Walden. We carry all of these books except the Hamilton book at the shop at Walden Pond, and we sell a lot of them. And, and I'm really happy about that. Um, and I, I even get to autograph them sometimes, which is kind of fun. You know, I'm still kind of knocked out. It's only been, I've only been a, a writer for three years. Yeah. So I'm still kind of excited when people ask me to sign my books. I think it's kind of cool. It is a lot of fun. So wh where do you see this going from here? Do you plan to keep writing with Applewood? Do you have any ideas for expanding your writing now that you've gotten a I would love to keep writing for Applewood. Um, Taste of this? I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. Um, I'm just, just curious, where do you see that yourself growing from here with your writing career? Do you see yourself continuing just with Applewood or perhaps expanding beyond into to other areas with your I writing? would love to I, I mean I definitely could see myself continuing to write with Applewood they've been really great um, my editors have been have been really patient with me um, and have been a huge help I really feel like uh, you know I've talked to some people who are scared of their editors um, my editors have been nothing but amazing and and have helped me every step of the way um, you know uh, if I can see myself, I mean, I've got all kinds of ideas as to who I would like to write about. I would love to do more short biographies. I would love to do more quote books. You know, I know that my editors have talked about some ideas. So we'll see if we can get the, uh, the signers of the constitution published, um, hopefully maybe this year. Um, I'm sure, I hope there'll be more books in my future. I really like, I really like writing these books. Um, I really enjoy it. I love the, I love the research. I love, I love putting their lives, these people's lives into my, into my own words. Um, yeah, if, you know, if, uh, if a major publisher wanted to contact me and ask me to write a book for them, sure, I would gladly do that as well. <laughs> you know, if, uh, uh, if any of the big publishing houses are watching, sure, yes, send me an email. Well. Well, uh, you can contact the page, send us, send us a private message and we'll put you in touch with Richard. Absolutely. If, you know, if, if uh, Harper Lee or whoever, any of the big publishing firms are, are checking in, contact me. I'll gladly write for you. So do we have any, do we have questions from people at all? Um, I think that you have answered most of the questions that have, I, I have seen. Um, Do you have any any closing thoughts as we wrap this up here? No, I well, yes, of course. I think that first, if anybody wants my books, um, you can get any of them from the applewoodbooks.com. Uh, just go to their website and Google in Richard Smith. Um, all of my books, except for the Alexander Hamilton book, the, the two John Muir books and the two Thoreau books are available at the shop of, at Walden Pond, uh, shop at waldenpond.org. That is, that is a, I'm, I interrupted your website, uh, but that is a nonprofit shop, correct? That supports Absolutely. the Thoreau Society. Absolutely. So, so yeah, so uh, shop at Walden Pond is the non, is the bookstore that uh, all of the proceeds go to the Thoreau Society. And so the two John Muir books and the Henry Thoreau book is there. If you go online and, and, and buy them, um, I'm at the shop all the time. I would even sign them for you if you're interested. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully if we keep doing this, maybe next year, I'll have another book or two that we can talk about if we, if we keep the, uh, this, this Facebook page going.
So All right. but I would like to I would like to thank you first and foremost, Catherine, for putting this together. I really want to thank um, the people who hosted this, Barrow Books, my my amazing friends at Barrow Books here in Concord. Uh, they were one of the hosts for this, and Applewood Books was one of the hosts as well. And I would like to thank them and you um, for letting me do this this evening. It's been really fun. Indeed, it has. Thank you so much for chatting with us tonight, Richard. Um, well, I think that we are going to wrap things up here this evening. As always, thank you so much for everyone spending part of your evening with us. We will be back here on Monday with a poet, Kay McCoy, who will be sharing some of her poetry collection with us. Uh, so that will be a first for this program. Um, and we will see you again soon. Have a good night.